12.205. Welcome, everybody. Thank you very much for joining our session. It's a, a pleasure to see you. Thank you for your interest in Linux Foundation research. My name is Hillary Carter. I lead the research function in partnership with uh, Steve Hendrick, our VP of research, who will uh, join me in, in presenting how we contribute to the open source ecosystem, uh, how we go about creating our research insights, and uh, how you can get involved. So without further ado, our goal at Linux Foundation Research is to investigate the impact of open source projects, um, of open source software, open hardware, open standards, and open data, and try to describe through data how our projects are making an impact, what the trends are, and, and use that data to, um, importantly, inform decision making. Um, at the enterprise level, at the project level, and so on, allowing our, our communities to leverage data to inform how they allocate budgets, where they um, uh, can dedicate uh, resources and activations to try to close some of the gaps that research reports identify. Is it, uh, are there issues with um, adoption? Are there issues with uh, uh, community um, sentiment and diversity, equity, and inclusion issues, you know, where are the gaps, where are the challenges, and use research reports to try to fix them. So if you're not yet familiar with us, this is our home, linuxfoundation.org slash research. Uh, we were founded in 2021 um, on a tradition of research excellence at Linux Foundation uh, as early as 2018, publishing the Linux kernel history report, and uh, in 2020, the FOSS contributor survey, which was in partnership with the Harvard Laboratory of Innovation Science. And these reports were well received, and I think the decision at the time was, let's keep a good thing going. Let's do more of this and add v net new value to our community and create something together that everyone can benefit from. And so we generate insights through uh, survey work, uh, qualitative interviews, and analyzing data sets from SCA vendors, for example, uh, GitHub repositories or SCA vendor data, and um, produce research deliverables that will uh, uh, describe what those trends and uh, gaps are. To date, we've more than 30 unique reports published. So it's been a very busy uh, two years and uh, a rewarding um, effort uh, to be a part of because it is so uh, value additive. The way we go about uh, creating research is uh, using frameworks of analysis. Uh, we have industry-specific research reports. To date, we've published projects in um, energy and education and training. If you heard Jim Zemlin's keynote this morning, he referenced our 2023 jobs report. It's actually called the Tech Talent Survey. I beg your pardon, it was called the jobs report for years. But this year we're focusing on tech talent from the um, uh, enterprise point of view and the, how they go about seeking and retaining qualified tech talent. We've done reports in financial services uh, as, as well as media and entertainment, the film, um, a motion picture industry. We've done a lot of reports along technological uh, lines. There are tech horizontals in, in blockchain and cloud, uh, AI and data, uh, cybersecurity, um, FinOps, and, and more, as well as reports that are quite broad. We call them ecosystem-wide reports, issues, and to an extent, cybersecurity could be called an ecosystem report because it affects all industries and all technologies. Um, but looking at leadership and governance, the role of the open source program office, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, uh, looking at the developer experience and the maintainer experience, and issues like climate change. We also fairly recently launched a new framework, and that's looking at open source dynamics along geographic lines. What are the differences in, in communities at different levels? We can do uh, city-based studies, country studies, um, continental studies, as we've done initially with Europe. And we'll be doing more of these reports this year, and Steve will tell you about some of that work that's in the field presently. Our deliverables include reports, uh, they're free, they're, they're published under Creative Commons license, so you may use them, you can publish them on your own website, you can share them broadly, uh, but because of the nature of our research and, and a lot of involvement qualitatively, 
uh, they are published under non-derivative uh, license. Um, we publish blogs that talk about the whys and wherefores and the high-level findings and often, as we're doing today, have a, a live discussion at an event or will we'll be part of um, a, a digital webinar. All of our data is available on data.world. And this is so that our communities can dig into the findings, can conduct their own research, maybe come up with a different perspective that we didn't consider in our analysis. But feel free to dig into any of our data sets on data.world and uh, take advantage. None of the data that we publish is, um, there's no personally identifiable information. That's a core ethic at LF Research is to keep our respondents uh, privacy protected. So, so far, um, Many of our projects have been supported by individual member organizations, uh, including VMware, Intel, uh, FutureWay, uh, Palm NFT Studio, and others. And uh, we've also received funding from project communities like Hyperledger Foundation, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, um, a FinTech and Open Source Foundation. So that is how we are funded. If you are interested in helping us, we'll, we'll, I'll describe ways that you can get involved a little bit later on. But there's no topic uh, that we couldn't uh, explore, um, at least giving it some, some careful, careful consideration about our ability to be successful in a research project. But as I mentioned previously, we've published lots of great reports um, in the areas referenced here on the slide. Now I'll invite my colleague Steve Hendrick to explore the methodology um, that we apply in our quantitative uh, research process. Steve, come on up. Sure. Okay, thanks, Hillary. Are you locked up? Or I am. Oh, so you can turn that one off. So if you wanted to know a little bit about how the sausage is made, this is the right place to come. Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the research process that we, uh, in, we utilize here at Linux Foundation. Um, so it's actually pretty simple. There's a, a planning process we go through where we plan out what we wanna do with the uh, research itself, what are our objectives, uh, what are the headlines that we want to see come out of the research if possible? And that shapes development of a survey instrument, and that survey instrument um, is sort of the keys to the kingdom because the survey instrument is actually what you're going to throw out in the field and has the questions you're going to ask. Um, and those questions define everything that follows. So the quality of that research instrument is uh, absolutely critical from the standpoint of being able to get, collect data in the right way uh, and be able to do the analysis you wanted to do. And then you don't really know what the findings are gonna be until you get to uh, the analysis. Uh, but dig deep into the analysis to find some really um, uh, com you know, uh, compelling insights from the research. So there's four slides here on sort of the research process. I'm gonna show you the kind of the money slide after that. If you have any questions, you might as well just ask them as we go. So this is research planning. So we talk to stakeholders for the project, you know, discuss their needs, objectives. Uh, we put a proposal together, which has a lot of information about how we're gonna do this, what the objectives are, planning, deliverables, timing, pricing, all that. Uh, we've, we've revised the, price, the proposal because often uh, they'll say, <laughs> we, we, we want it faster, we want it cheaper. Um, and then we'll put together a project schedule. So research execution, um, I'm gonna go that, into that in more detail here, uh, but there is um, an opportunity here to talk to subject matter experts if we need to before we do the project to educate us, if need be, from the standpoint of some of the more nuanced, uh, important issues that we have to look into. Uh, we developed something called a survey reference model, which is in fact the questionnaire for the survey, plus a lot of other information that you'll see in a moment. Uh, then once we get that, we present that, once we get it approved by the stakeholders, we go and we do the program, we do the testing and put it out into the field. 
Um, once it's out in the field, uh, we monitor it. We do data quality tests periodically uh, to make sure that we're collecting the data and it's coming in the way we would expect and there's nothing wrong with the survey instrument itself. Uh, and we do sort of periodic uh, analysis of the data just to see what's going on. Anyway, um, so from all of that, we create a whole bunch of results, uh, massive results stack. We go into key findings from that. Uh, we'll do SME interviews again at the end if there are particular topics that have surfaced in the research that we want to know more about. And because ultimately we'll be writing a report about this and we want to be able to have um, not only, you know, get the answers to the key questions and show the key insights that we found, but also uh, dig into it um, with relevant uh, commentary from people who are experts in the area, because we can't be experts in everything that we do. Um, okay, and then there's the delivery process uh, in terms of how we write the report. M massive review cycles with stakeholders, and then we finally get to the point of handing it off to the creative team, and they make it look beautiful, and uh, we put all the data out on data.world. So that's kind of a short story on how we do, what our research process is. Um, and it's a really nice one because that enables us, if there's four of us who actually do research, uh, hands-on with this particular execution model. And if anybody, for instance, you know, has to stop working and run off to do some other firefighting, anybody can pick it up without even a, uh, any kind of loss of time because we have the same particular process that all of us follow and uh, all the same kind of terminology and nomenclature we use to describe what we're all doing. So. Anyway, this starts with the survey reference model. Uh, we do use SurveyMonkey as a data collection tool. Uh, I'm not a big fan of it for analysis, but that's okay because we have MarketSight, um, which is a, a fabulous an analytical tool for doing frequencies and cross tabs, so very basic kinds of stuff. But it does talk about confidence limits um, uh, in all of the analysis that MarketSight generates, and it's the only tool I know of that will automatically generate graphics in batch mode um, without you know, having to click you to death for every single slide that you want to create. So that's the, the way we actually execute on research. Now let me talk about um, sort of one thing that kind of keeps me up at night and I'm always thinking about, which is how can we improve our research quality? And it really comes down to two things. We can improve the way we do the actual research, the research process, and we can also improve the, the quality of the people that we talk to because the respondents are the ones that this information is coming from. If you talk to the right people, you get good information. Talk to the wrong people, you don't. So uh, there are ways to deal with both of these. So let me just talk a little bit about um, what we can do internally from a research process standpoint to get higher quality. One of the first things we can do is stop making the, the surveys so long. Um, you know, we're famous for doing like 50 to 60 question surveys and we torture people and I must apologize for that. We've got to, we've got to stop doing that because it's, you know, 20, 25 minutes in a survey is just not what people are looking for. So more sh frequent surveys uh, and certainly shorter surveys is sort of the order of the day. Um, there's also, from this internal perspective, a framework for asking questions in a more somewhat standardized way uh, is really important because that will allow us then to be able to uh, compare results uh, much more easily and have a, a much more compelling way that we can describe the information because it's not just a framework for how you ask the question, it's also a framework for how you're going to analyze the question when the data comes back. And so from the standpoint of looking at current state, future state sort of issues when it comes to our questions, or as I say here in the slide, you know, uh, adoption of technology, penetration rates, how to do growth share matrices in compelling ways, uh, correlation between questions and samples, forecasts and confidence limits around forecasts, all of that can really benefit from having a good solid framework from the standpoint of how you want to ask the questions and how you're going to be able to analyze them. Um, and so my, my objective here is to kind of move us from this idea of having delivering today, you know, data and perspective, which I think is sort of step one to really being able to get to trusted insights. 
And we you know we can get deep insights by doing a lot of cross-tabbing and deep driving deeper into variables to understand what's going on in a segmented way. Um, but trusted insights is a more challenging um, issue. And I'll talk to you about how we're gonna get there. But from the standpoint of this whole issue of research, um, if you have better data quality, you're gonna have the information data itself that allows you to make better decision making. That's gonna have an impact on how your, what your strategies are going to be and ultimately um, give you a lot more industry relevance from the standpoint of how you can do your analysis. Uh, because with improved data quality, especially over time, then it gives you a, a ability to do some sort of different kinds of longitudinal analysis uh, to see how things are changing over time, which is really interesting. So what I sort of figured out uh, not too difficultly <laughs> is that when it comes to research quality, one of the biggest and hardest things to address is the quality of the respondent that you're talking to. And so we, I've been doing surveys now for 30 years. I've done close to 150 surveys, I guess, in my career. And uh, respondent quality has always been an issue. So how are we going to deal with that? Uh, well, one way is that we can engage more extensively with the LF community, and we, do, we try to do that already, um, but it can be very challenging because people are overwhelmed with surveys these days. Uh, you know, your bank sends you surveys, everybody, you know, your grocery store sends you a survey. Everybody wants to know your perspective. Um, so people are tired of taking surveys. So what we have to do is we have to be able to rise above that. So we have to have some way to be able to actively engage people and essentially incent them to want to do work with us. And we like the idea of being able to incent them. I think it's a win for them. And if they have a lot of particular expertise they want to share with us, it's a win for us. So anyway, um, the ELF community is quite large. There's what, about 1.5 million people in the community. 1.3, 1.5. Uh, those are people we know about. The community. Okay, okay. Well, three million in the contact list. Okay, right. And 700,000 where we know a lot about them, yes. So there's quite a few people out there. Um, so we would love to be able to engage with the people that want to work with us on quantitative research. Um, so it's not hard for us to reach out to them, but, it, but we have to have a story to tell. So, um, so things we have to keep in mind as we do this is that we certainly want to make sure that we don't we observe all the privacy policies so that people are you know are not concerned about um, anything that, any information that they share going to the wrong place. Uh, so that's not that hard for us to do. We're already pretty good at it now. Um, we also need to have meaningful incentives to be able to say, you know, if you're going to help us, we need to help you a bit. Um, and I'll talk to you about those in just a second in terms of what my ideas are. Um, and ultimately, the last bullet here, we want to grow our LF research panel uh, that's comprised of the community um, who are interested in sharing information and knowledge with us. Um, and that's going to help us improve the quality of the research at the end of the day. So that's the objective. From the standpoint of the benefits of the panel to somebody who's a part of the panel, um, well, you know, first of all, um, it's going to avoid people getting uh, requests to take surveys that don't want to take a survey. And so the, the level of noise coming out of Linux Foundation in terms of asking people to participate in quantitative research will be able to go down because we'll have a, a panel of people who are interested in taking surveys. Uh, so that will help us also avoid pestering people who are really not interested. Um, and we'll make sure that if you're out there, you'll be able to communicate your particular interests about opting in and opting out. Um, but we also need some sort of a mech, uh, sort of a, a really compelling, I, I hate to use the term economic, uh, but it kind of comes down to that incentive here. Uh, we already provide discounts on courses to people that take our surveys. They're pretty generous discounts, too. Um, and we can extend that across everything that Linux Foundation does. So it's very focused on training and certification right now. But I think we can kind of get it across everything in our portfolio that we do. 
Um, we also probably can put together a way to do donations to charity um, if that's something you want. But the idea of having credits to a participant that's part of the panel from the standpoint of being able to then spend those credits on, for instance, coming to events uh, or taking classes or swag, um, I think would be in compelling in some, some of the right ways from the standpoint of incenting people as opposed to, um, you, know, you know, here's a, a drawing for an iPad or something, which I think would incent all the wrong people. So, um, so anyway, once we have a panel in place, there's lots of things we can do like a longitudinal research, uh, going to the exact people that answered questions year after year, which is true longitudinal research as opposed to quasi where you go to different people year to year. All right, as far as the timeline for it, um, you know, we're, we've already built the requirements document for what we need to do here. Uh, we're in discussions with um, the technical people at LF about how LFX and CDP functionality is going to have to change to be able to support all of this. And we're looking about a beta release last quarter of this year, and then a real full-fledged uh, production le release beginning of next year. All right, any questions on that? All right, as far as upcoming research goes, um, State of Tech Talent, you've already seen that, that came out today. Um, very exciting stuff. Um, so I was driving the research for that particular project, um, and I was very interested to sort of see how did 2022 influence what was gonna go on in 2023. And so 59% of the people in the survey were concerned about uh, sort of what the financial climate was looking like in 2022. Um, and so the 60% of people that were hiring in 2022 when we did this last year, went down to about 44% this year, which is a, well, not actually not much of a, of a slide. The people that were considering freezing hiring went from 20% last year to 30% this year, so that bumped up. Um, but the really interesting thing was that the people that really were thinking about reducing their technical hiring went from 20% uh, in 2022 down to simply 8% in 2023. So despite a lot of the concerns about the economy, um, from the standpoint of technical staff uh, you know, hiring, um, there was some, but not nearly as much as I expected. And there's a lot of optimism about what's going to happen as we go into 2024. So very cool stuff. Upskilling was the other thing that came out of this report. Um, we always look at upskilling because, you know, we have a huge training and certification business. Um, but when we looked at it in this report, I took the opportunity to weave it into all different kinds of dimensionality from the standpoint of the questions that we were asking, because it was a pretty big survey, um, going against my rule of uh, make them shorter. Um, and uh, sort of unilaterally, we found a ton of interest in upskilling these days, more so than even a college education. And certainly I think that reflects the increasing difficulty that organizations are having to find the right skills for the roles that they have internally. And so if you can't find people on the outside, uh, you either can wait um, and you know, take a year and a half or so to find somebody, you can get a consultant, or you can upskill. And upskilling does, doesn't work in all situations, but it works a lot of the time. And upskilling was, I think, the number one uh, response in many different ways that we asked this question about upskilling. So uh, very exciting for us to, to hear that from this, uh, this study. Uh, Henry Chesbro is a professor at University of Berkeley. And um, he was, um, we reached out, he's a, a pioneer in looking at uh, the economics of open source and um, has already written one or two books on the topic that are revered in the open source space from the standpoint of how open source uh, drives innovation in the economy. And it's just, it's fascinating stuff. So we had him go out and uh, do some more specific measurements around what's going on in open source. Um, and some pretty, pretty cool findings. Um, I think this was the, this was the, uh, the infographic that, that came out of the report. 
And so we all know that open source costs less. I think on the bottom left-hand panel, you see here that um, from the standpoint of being all in on whether you're using open source or some other kind of solution, whether you build it yourself or, or buy something proprietary or some combination of that and consultants, um, that, you know, open source was about a quarter of the expense of other solutions. Um, and in some cases, I, I'm sure it was higher. Uh, I mean, lower in terms of uh, open source being less expensive than just, you know, uh, everything else being four times the co cost of open source. But um, so this is a relatively conservative view, but powerful nevertheless. It was empirically based and it was um, pretty, pretty good data. So uh, that was that was great to see. Uh, we had an OSPO survey that I think has been announced today as well. Um, this is more, something that we do every year. And there was a, uh, this year's survey was, as I'm sort of, was a relatively, is a, is a big survey, I, I guess I have to admit. Uh, but you don't have to do all the sections depending upon how you answer the questions. So hopefully uh, it, won't be a, it won't be a struggle for people. But um, one of the really exciting consequences of having it being a larger survey is that we can dig deeper into all of those different issues that um, are interesting to people about that are want to know about how OSPOs will make a difference inside of their organization. Uh, so from the standpoint of the size of the OSPO responsibilities, the impact on economics, benefits, the challenges of OSPOs, um, and what the characteristics are of maturing OSPOs, all of that is covered in the survey. So I encourage you to go out and, um, and take the survey. It would be great to, uh, to hear from you. Then we have another survey that was, um, I guess, went out in April, but it's also being talked up uh, here at this event. Uh, and this is our you know, global spotlight, world of open source. This is a worldwide study. Most of ours are, in fact, I think OSPO is as well and everything else we've been talking about. Um, but this one was, is really fabulous um, because it's all about how organizations are using open source, how they're contributing to open source, uh, what kinds of open source they use from a technology standpoint, um, and the value of open source to their organization. So. Uh, really, really cool set of questions that we're asking there. And back to Hillary. Thanks, Steve. Sure. Amazing. Uh, one of the things that I love about this partnership at Elf Research with Steve is that he brings years of quantitative uh, experience to the project. My background prior to joining the LF was creating a lot of mostly qualitative um, reports. And we've carried on our respective traditions and blended them. And what I think is so important about the qualitative process is the opportunity to engage our community um, subject matter experts to give them uh, an opportunity to have their perspectives be heard, to go on record, or to contribute anonymously. And um, for us to meet uh, the names and the faces. The, some of the challenges with surveys is that the data is anonymous, but we do ha have opportunities to build personal uh, contacts and networks and really understand who who are the leaders um, in these respective studies that we do. So one of the studies that we've published uh, based on qualitative uh, work is the business value of the OSPO. Uh, uh, and to engage with so many different partner communities, including VMware, thank you, Suzanne, for being a, a supporter of uh, this study, um, conducting uh, numerous interviews with uh, OSPO leaders. And here's some of the uh, findings. Um, most open source program offices tend to uh, originate to deal with a, a problem. Um, whether that was a, 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 an inappropriate use of, of a piece of software, uh, not complying with licensing or uh, another kind of challenge. Uh, other challenges mentioned uh, include um, creating an open source culture within an organization, uh, educating stakeholders across the organization about the value of open source, and how do you measure success for your open source efforts and for the effort of establishing an OSPO. 
Uh, OSPO KPIs that are most widely implemented include how do you sustain growing numbers of contributors to projects and how do you measure the success of those projects internally and uh, uh, at the community level? And what can OSPOs do um, beyond just simply managing consumption of uh, or usage of open source code? Well, how do you take an OSPO and create an open source strategy, something that creates real business value as part of an overall open source sustainability uh, vision? Uh, Steve mentioned are working with Henry Chesbro, the so-called father of open innovation. Uh, we had the wonderful opportunity to conduct a qualitative roundtable with Henry Chesbro and uh, a group of academics, practitioners, and people from enterprise at the Open Innovation Conference in Eindhoven, uh, Netherlands, discussing what we believed, our hypothesis was that open source is a lever to be applied, especially during an economic downturn, mostly because of the cost, low cost uh, innovation opportunities that open source creates. And so these were the findings for that discussion, that yes, it is a, a widely accepted to be a low cost, high quality alternative. Um, yes, open source uh, has this tremendous opportunity that is unrealized right now to advance public sector initiatives so that the so that governments around the world can become model users and the, the most cost effective pathway to creating digital citizen centric services is often through open source software and to create opportunities for digital sovereignty not being dependent upon vendors from other regions this is particularly uh, uh, this is a sentiment that is um, common in, in Europe, wanting to achieve a European identity in their innovation initiatives. And what are the barriers? Uh, the, the identifying lack of leadership and um, regulatory barriers that prevent some organizations uh, from having their team members contribute to open source projects. Uh, that is uh, a limitation and something that we need to help uh, work together across the community to change those regulatory barriers. We published a project on uh, open source wallets, making the case for why the world needs an open source digital wallet. Uh, we need a new infrastructure that will empower individuals, organizations, governments to, to transact in a more trusted capacity and in almost a limitless number of use cases, whether it relates to digital identity or custody of, of uh, currency or custody of keys, um, trusted credentials, uh, security of, our, of tokens uh, like our, our real estate deeds. One of the challenges in, in Puerto Rico following Hurricane Maria was that homeowners could not prove that they were the beneficial owner of their property and therefore they didn't qualify for assistance from FEMA for months and months and months. These are the problems that are solved through um, digital wallets and uh, a tokenization and the Open Wallet Foundation is helping advance the understanding of what are digital wallets, what problems do they solve, um, uh, what uh, what are the challenges around existing wallet infrastructure and the widespread protocols that are issuing and storing and exchanging digital assets presently? And how do we reconcile um, a very fragmented environment when it comes to, to uh, digital asset protocols today? Um, and how do we how do we enable innovators to create uh, their own wallets and not rely on one or two vendors. So exciting opportunities. Uh, if you read one report this year, I would say read this one. This is really interesting. This is how um, leaders across open source communities are overcoming challenges of fragmentation, whether that fragmentation is linguistic, uh, whether it is technological uh, or, or, or other. Um, how can we increase collaboration? How do we work together to solve some common challenges. And what this report revealed was that we fragmentation is real. Uh, we are fragmented across open source communities in terms of language, culture, geopolitics, and that impairs our ability to be as effective and as innovative as we might otherwise be.
Techno-nationalism does pose a threat to open source collaboration, and we need to find pathways to overcome those geopolitical tensions and reinforce that we are, uh, in an ideal world, all uh, one global community that, that wants to make code more robust um, and more effective. Um, leaders also said we need to better align some of our projects that share uh, common uh, priorities, uh, sustainability being one of them. How do we avoid duplication? At the Linux Foundation alone, we have four different projects that are working on digital identity. That's a kind of fragmentation unto itself. The good news where fragmentation is concerned is that the longer the technology has been around, the less fragmented the environment. So if you think of COVID, everyone was scrambling to create a COVID notification app at a time of crisis, and there were there were solutions here and solutions there and a whole wide variety of solutions. So new technologies have lots and lots of fragmentation. Over time, the winners emerge and uh, the market essentially picks the winners. We're also doing work um, to better understand challenges that our maintainers face. Uh, in March of this year, we published, no, not March of this year, March of last year, we published a report, Census 2, in collaboration with Harvard's uh, Laboratory of Innovation Science, identifying the most widely used open source um, application libraries. Why did we do this? Well, if we understand what is the most widely used software, we can prioritize our efforts to try to make it more secure. In identifying those packages, we tried to identify the maintainers of those packages and, and reach out to them and have conversations with them and say, what challenges are you facing? How can we help? What tooling do you need? Jim Zemlin mentioned the, you know, the need for more time to work on projects. Uh, but these are really vital conversations and research provides a, a mechanism for stakeholders like maintainers to be heard uh, and, and to inspire the community to get involved to try to enhance their experiences. Finally, I'd like to just invite all of you to stay in touch with LF Research, uh, to um, sign up to receive our newsletters, to receive our surveys right in your inbox. Uh, we'll, as Steve mentioned, uh, work on, on creating a, a panel a community where we can engage um, as effectively as possible and try to minimize some of the challenges for research like survey fatigue and provide appropriate incentives uh, and engagement opportunities. You may have noticed how uh, in, our, um, in our surveys and in the research reports, how many different organizations have come forward to distribute surveys, to sponsor surveys, uh, and to get involved. And it is a most enriching and rewarding activity to collaborate with so many different organizations on unique research projects. And so this is an open invitation to get involved. If you are interested in sponsoring a piece of research, let's have a conversation. Very briefly, the benefits are brand visibility, having the opportunity to conduct a, a very specific study and, and um, answer a, a pestering question, um, can, a, a contributing to uh, findings and addressing um, issues as well as having early access to those findings. So we will uh, make the experience as value additive and as uh, fiscally rewarding and it w invite you to um, consider uh, LF research projects as you form your budgets uh, throughout um, uh, 2024 and join us. Thank you. I, I, I would like to invite questions for Steve or me. And we have one minute. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, it is. It is available on a data dot world in Linux Foundation projects. And the title of that report is called Census Two. Uh, identifying the most widely used application libraries. I think that's the subtitle. Yeah, data.world has the complete list of uh, the data sets. And that data came from uh, three SCA vendor companies, uh, Sneak, um, Fossa, and Synopsys.
so in terms of contributing other ways that you can get involved in LF research, if you have data, we are going to update census too. We would love to work with more SCA vendors. We'd love to get another data set because all we can do is provide a measure. The more data sets we have, the, the better that measure can be. And we'll respect your organization's privacy uh, in the process. Thanks for that question. It is 2.45 and I believe that wraps our session. Thanks everybody. <laughs>